Hi there, I'm Realtor Sarah Morrow with Cell State Ace Realty. I'm eager to speak today on Property Time with Derek Shepard, General Manager of Everest Mechanical. Derek not only leads this great organization's Longmont location, but he's also himself a master mechanical service provider. This means that he's certified in heating, refrigeration, cooling, and ventilation. Derek's been helping homeowners find more efficient ways to heat, cool, and ventilate for over 25 years, and he's been certified in full-time in the industry for even longer than that. Derek also helps train his long-standing growing team to do great work and creatively solve problems at a fair price. He's a master plumber and he's a family man. He lives in Berthoud with his wife, three sons, and has a daughter on the way. Between their Longmont, Estes Park, and Arvada locations, Everest's technicians serve the whole front range. We consumers tend to really take the heating and cooling systems of our homes for granted. And it's not really until the temperatures outside get extreme that we even realize how badly we need an expert like Derek to help keep our space comfortable and help keep our house feeling like a home. Hi, Derek. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. No, it's good to see you, Sarah. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So let's dive right in. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Everest Mechanical, what you do there, what you love about your job? Very good. Yeah. Uh, so Everest Mechanical started in 2019 in uh, February. Uh, it came from uh, another company that I was with. Uh, that have been in business for about 30 years um, and we uh, started with about a five-man shop uh, up in Estes Park and uh, within about nine months we uh, started in Longmont. I opened up that location and uh, we also opened up another location in Arvada. So we went from five employees, we have about 45 people now. Wow, so. that's a quick expansion. Yeah. Especially yeah. during a pandemic. Yeah, we were uh, we were hiring like crazy during the pandemic. Mm. So uh, by doing, doing good business and taking care of your customers, great customer service, uh, business builds, and it makes work for people, so. We love that, especially here in Longmont. So uh, can you tell us a little bit, let me just start with some basics. First of all, I've been so excited to have an HVAC episode. You don't know how hard it is to come by an HVAC professional, especially a manager who's willing to come in and talk to you because these guys are so, so busy. Yeah. Especially when the, right now the season's changing, the temperatures are changing, so you're so valuable and I so appreciate your time. Um, why don't we just start with like, what are some things that you wish us homeowners just like already knew? Like what are your most frequently asked questions? What are your most frequent issues? Is it furnace, is it AC? You know, is it ever just a filter that you got to go and change and like, ugh, what a, what a crazy thing to do on like a long trip. Like, can you give us a sense of just what do homeowners not tend to know that you wish we all knew? Yeah, definitely. No, that's a great question. So, uh, depending on the season, uh, whether it's cold or hot out, uh, some of the biggest issues we see in homes are, as you mentioned, filters. Uh, the other ones are thermostats. So there's a couple things that you know that we can look into before uh, you'd have to call a professional out. Uh, but always make sure your uh, furnace filters are changed out about one month. Uh, maximum three months and uh, the uh, thermostats sometimes they need batteries or sometimes they're not in heating or cooling mode so those are a couple tips uh, before you have to call a professional out okay like those easy gets yeah yeah <laughs> they're actually it's actually a real common service call so a lot of times we'll come out to a uh, property and find out you know it's just uh, just a filter that needs to be changed or uh, a thermostat isn't actually telling it to turn on or off. Got it, got it. So this is another kind of stupid question, but I've got to ask. So can you just talk first about, you know, heat? So there's radiator heat, there's natural gas, there's furnace, boilers. Can you talk a little bit about like the few types of systems that you see in Longmont? Yeah, and of course. Which one's better, more efficient? Like. And, and whether or not people ever change their method. Definitely. So, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different ways to heat your home. Um, it's uh, through the uh, heat delivery system that uh, we're going to see benefits of efficiency and comfort. Um, we're about 5,000 feet in Longmont. Um, the uh, air molecules are kind of thin. So if we look at more of a forced air system, it's going to be a little bit less comfortable here as than it would be in sea level. 
Sorry. So, okay. Yeah. To, to clarify, when you say 5,000 feet, you're talking about elevation. Elevation. Which yeah. does impact the heat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, a forced air heating system basically heats and cools air molecules mm -hmm. um, to uh, bring the temperature in your home to a comfortable uh, rate. So if we're uh, heating air molecules, we have less air molecules to heat. Uh, you're going to spend more energy trying to heat the air and it's also going to be less comfortable because we don't have that insulation value to kind of hold that heat. So if we look into uh, the most efficient heating systems there are, are uh, hot water heating systems, uh, in-floor heating, um, baseboard heat. So what it does is it actually heats the objects in the room instead of the air. Hmm. So uh, your floors would be warm, your walls, granite countertops. Uh, if you have granite in your home, it's amazing if you have hot water heat because it actually heats the granite up. So if you, on a cold winter day, if you're sitting there having coffee and you put your arms up on the table, uh, it'll start absorbing the heat from your body and make you cold. Mm -hmm. uh, the radiant heating system, that doesn't happen. Interesting. Um, when we're building up a thermal mass inside of the house, the heat that's inside of the house that makes everything comfortable in there, a um, uh, forced air heating system has a lot more trouble doing that. Um, the benefits though to forced air heating is it heats quick. So if you want to shut your thermostat off during the day and let your house cool down to 60 degrees or something and then cool it up to, or warm it up to 70 at night, you can uh, turn on a forced air heating system and it can do that in you know 30 minutes or so. So that's one of the benefits of forced air is we can uh, drop that temperature off uh, like on a uh, thermostat with a schedule and uh, while you're not there, leave it a, at a lower level so you don't have to sp spend that energy heating the home and have it warmed up by the time you get home. Where a hot water heating system, it takes either hours or days to heat a home up to that comfortable level. Gotcha. So let's take the example, like I've seen a lot, it, that's very valuable information and it's interesting now I'm kind of oh, thinking about the air versus the items in my house being warm. But really common thing I see around Longmont are, you know, the baseboard, you're saying radiator heat. Yeah, yeah. That's baseboard heat. Yeah. Those, those, those things from the 70s that are... Yep. Now, if someone doesn't want that, any, first of all, is that electric? That's, that's always electric? Great question. Almost always? There's, um, there's um, two types of those. So there's an electric uh, style. There's also hot water. So we would uh, basically run hot water through that system and okay. it would heat that way. Um, those heat by basically uh, radiant and convection. So you're actually pulling cold air from the floor through the radiator and it's heating the cold air because you know if you ever wear shorts in your house and your legs get cold sure um it takes that uncomfortable feeling away gotcha and it also radiates to objects in the room interesting so that's just one ventilation method there can be two different heating methods that can be used through that there is there is okay. um so we can either use um electric or hot water, hot water. Okay. and hot water can be heated through electricity heat transfer or gas. Now is that true in other, I'm thinking mostly about the older homes in Longmont, including my own, if there are vents in other places in the house, is it safe to assume that you can use those same two methods through a different kind of venting, like those vents that are in the ceiling mm -hmm. or the vents that are also on the wall, maybe not the long you know, radiator types, but just those grates, is that, are those very similar? Um, that's uh, what you would see more with, um, uh, forced air okay. heating system, um, you know, something with a blower that's heating air molecules. Okay, got it it. Uh, uses those those vents to get the uh, warm or cool air out, basically. So you're not using hot water or electric in that case? That's more of a forced air? You actually air. can. Uh, okay. So we can heat air molecules with hot water as well. Okay. Uh, through a, it looks just like a furnace, except we'll just run hot water through some coils and then that heats the air coming out. Now, I think I follow. Now tell me the difference between you know, gas and electric. You said like conducting of energy versus gas. Like, can you talk to me about, could those two things also be used in 
a combination of methods of venting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so um, the older style, if we look into uh, the older style of baseboards that are electric, usually, uh, I think in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, we were going into this uh, lower carbon footprint kind of thing and pushing more towards electricity and getting away from gas. Got so uh, from here, you know, long mud, even up into the mountains, uh, we were seeing a lot of electric heating systems with mm -hmm. that electric baseboard or electric radiant in the ceilings, which is just a heat resistance wire that heats up. And it started getting really expensive for people to heat their homes with that because it's, uh, you have to generate the electricity and then you use the electricity to make the heat. So you're generating heat from those. Mm -hmm. uh, really expensive way to heat a home. You'll have really high electrical bills with something like that. Um, so we've started pushing more into hot water heat um, because now the new equipment, the new boilers, they can run up to 98% plus efficiency. So what that means is that if you use one unit of gas, you're going to use 98% of that to uh, generate heat into that water. And that goes into your home. You're only losing 2% of the money that you spent on that gas that goes up the flue, mm. uh, which is pretty amazing. So that is using a combination of electricity and gas, but it's way more efficient. It uses a very small amount of electricity, basically, to pump the water through the system. I see. So the gas is heating and then it's done. It's not heating. There isn't a lot of electricity pumping into the air. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, basically generating heat in into uh, water. Right. So then there's a, a third way that uh, basically uh, everybody's starting to look towards, and it's called heat transfer. So that's kind of the newest um, in uh, heating systems now is heat transfer. So. Heat transfer, commonly, more commonly known as a heat pump, uh, mini splits, um, and stuff like that. So what we're basically doing is we're absorbing heat from either inside or outside, and then we're taking that heat and moving it where we don't want it, or do want it, uh, and squeezing the heat out. So for example, um, on, a, on a hot day, we have excess heat inside of a home. So the system's going to absorb the heat inside of your house and it takes it outside and it squeezes it out outside, therefore cooling the house. Um, if we look in a heating situation, even down to negative 20, negative 30 degrees, there's still heat inside of the air. So what we'll do is we'll absorb that heat from outside take it to the unit inside and squeeze the heat out inside of the home. So we're not actually generating heat. Mm. We're, we're moving it, we're transferring it from one place to the other. That's awesome. So the, the term for that, uh, our technical term for that is refrigeration, so. Interesting, so you're saying back in the day, let's call it 60s, 70s, 80s, when a lot of our homes were built, Gas and electricity were used to produce heat. So not only did it have to get generated, but then it had to get blown into the house somehow or blown into some piece of the house. But now we live in the desert, so we have heat and we have cool air, and you're just talking about using what we've got rather than generating using gas or electricity. Obviously there's a little bit of gas and or electricity being used, but you're saying we're just trying to preserve what we've got mm -hmm. and redistribute it. Yeah, yeah, instead of, uh instead of like you said having to generate that in the first place um we're making we're making heat we're just moving heat uh with with the heat transfer system which heat pump geothermal uh mini split those are kind of the terms that we use for the equipment that does that yeah can you talk more about those products so yeah. is a mini split one of those plastic things that's up yeah. on the top of a wall yeah it looks like it could be an AC unit, but it's not. Like I'm, I'm clueless. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. What it's a is great that question. product doing? Yeah. And how are you able to hold heat? What do you mean hold heat? If it's winter, there is no heat. Yeah. Right. So, um, <laughs> refrigeration concept goes as there is heat until it is at uh, absolute zero, which is negative 400 some degrees Fahrenheit. So Whoa. at negative 20 degrees, it's pretty cold. There's still heat in the air. So. What the mini split does is you have that little 
unit inside the little plastic unit that kind of sits up on the wall. And that has uh, two lines that go to an outdoor unit. What do you mean lines? Uh, the refrigeration lines. Uh, usually copper and they're insulated lines and um, what we transfer the heat with is inside of those copper lines which is uh, what we call refrigerant. So the refrigerant basically absorbs heat and then we take it and we squeeze the heat out and then it comes back and absorbs heat again. So that is it's incredible. a circular system. So just with some copper wires and this plastic thing that I can put up on my wall. Yeah. You can generate heat from the outdoors. Absorb, yes. Yeah. Absorb yeah. heat that exists already from Mother Nature. Yeah. Even though it feels to me really freezing. Yep. <laughs> and then that magical plastic thing is taking that heat that Mother Nature's giving it and moving it into my room. Yeah. I'm sorry, that seems a little bit like magic to me. It is, it is. It's, it, there's always a little bit of magic in everything we do, so. And you're saying that same thing can happen in the summer. It's finding cool air in the heat of summer outside. It's doing some magical thing and then it's dumping cooler air into my room through a refrigeration process. As we call it, we never call it as moving cold air. We call it as absorbing heat. Sorry. No, no, not at all. I like uh, it. Don't be I like sorry. It. I like the correction. So it, um, um, cool air doesn't really exist. It's basically air that is cooler than the other part of the air. So if you absorb the heat out of that air, it becomes cooler. It becomes cooler. Yeah. So you're saying, sorry, I just want to get this. There, you said mini split. You said a couple of other cool new products, mm -hmm. which are? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's mini split, uh, heat pump, and then geothermal heat pump. These are things that basically pull heat and cool not pull, absorb heat and cool from the outdoors mm -hmm. and, then it, and then it can transfer. Yeah. Okay. So, it, well, sticking with the product thing for a second, let's say I want, let's say I just have a shed, right? There's nothing going on in there. There's no furnace. You know, this isn't just a room of my home or my home that already has an existing system. This is like a, like a box outside. Do you need, could just getting a mini split and poking a hole in the wall produce some sort of ventilation, heat and or cooling? Or do you have to set up something much more um, intricate? Like do these mini splits and pumps feed into a bigger system or are they kind of like a standalone self-sustaining thing? Um, it's uh, that's a good question. Um, they pretty much take care of themselves. So if you have the indoor unit, the outdoor unit, and you basically have the insulation barrier, which is your wall, um, you can make this this make the inside of that unit either cooler or warmer uh, by using one of those systems. Sorry, say one more time. Indoor and outdoor unit. Yeah. These are just sort of stick on. They're almost like a. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but like. Like a window air conditioner. It's These just are things like that. that are yeah. an insert. Yeah. One goes inside, one goes outside. Yeah. And they talk to each other and do that, do that copper yep. conduit magic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm clearly not an expert, you are, but I'm I'm very intrigued. Can you say again, what would a pump do? Same thing as a mini split? Yeah, so it works, it's the same concept as a mini split. Uh, it's going to absorb heat and then it's going to squeeze heat out somewhere else. So it's, it's basic uh, heat transfer. Um, it works just like a mini split and it looks just like an outdoor air conditioner. So uh, heat pump, it's basically the same thing most people have in their homes around here. You see the big square outside unit with the fan on it. Um, what that does is it's either going to um, squeeze the heat out in the summertime and release it outside of the home or it's going to absorb the heat and push that heat inside of the house. I see. So it is a lot like what we know as an AC unit. Those yep. those big old AC drums outside. Works the outside. same. Works the same. Okay. The only difference is, is it reverses the flow of refrigeration. Okay. That's the only difference between a heat pump and a standard air conditioner. Understood. So um, that's fascinating. Can you, going back to this shed idea before I depart from that, does ventilation just happen? Or do I also need to 
poke a hole in the wall and get some fan, a fan somehow getting fresh air in? Or does this heat transfer take care of that? You addressed the temperature issue. But what about like stale air? Isn't that isn't that part of this? Like That's a great question. So um, ventilation can either happen naturally or you can force ventilation. So if we have a cylindrical tube and we run it from one area to another, air will always flow through that tube. It has a natural air draw to it. You mean like a vacuum that happens? It, um, something, cylindrical tubes, uh, air flows through them. Um, so if Whenever there's a cylindrical tube, it just naturally there's air naturally foiling through it and, sure. and moving through it. So that'd be like a natural draft or something. As long as it's round. Correct. Okay. Uh, when you do something square, the air molecules will hit the outsides of that and it flows less. It can still flow through it, but not as well as a cylindrical object. Um, if we force air through something, through a fan uh, or a blower, um, that's another way to move ventilation. Not to be confused with transfer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if we had uh, this uh, uh, shed scenario that you're talking about, we have a nice sealed up um, shed with insulation and everything uh, that will eventually run out of air inside of there. So we have another system that uh, we call uh, ERV, which is uh, an energy recovery, recovery ventilation system. What that does is it takes air from the outside and it exchanges it with the air on the inside and it has um, a heat transfer inside of it. So it absorbs either heat or cool and mm -hmm. warms the air coming in. So let's take, for example, it's uh, zero degrees out and let's say the shed is 70 degrees. If we bring air directly in from the outside, it's not gonna be very energy efficient because it's going to start cooling the shed. Right. So if we absorb the heat going out from the shed and transfer it into the air coming into the shed, it warms it naturally without a heat source. Whereas a mini split would not do that. You need the, the ERV to do what you're describing. Correct, yeah, because the, the mini split, they are considered a ductless system. Right. So that it's basically just a blower inside of that head that takes, it recirculates the air in, inside of that area. So it's, it's gonna pull the air into it and then push it out conditioned okay. for okay. the temperature that you want. So if you've got like a box outside, you really need an ERV. Mini yeah. splits are more for like, there's, a, there's some other form of ventilation to keep the air inside fresh so you don't run out of air. Correct, okay. correct. And uh, that is starting to become a, a code in most municipalities is okay. to have an ERV now because our homes that we're building are so energy efficient yeah. and so tightly sealed right. that we will uh, we'll have an oxygen deficiency inside of the home. How interesting is that? Uh, if you don't open or close doors enough, so. Whereas if a shed has like leaks in it, if it's a leaky shed, it'll breathe. This could this could have the mini split in theory versus needing the ERV. Yeah. Because at least you're getting leaking in air. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But these new homes, I mean, they pride themselves in being a lot like Tupperware. Like, mm -hmm. we're not letting anything out. Nothing's coming yeah. in, including bugs and chemicals and dust. But like you're saying, that could potentially lead to if you're not careful and if the right ventilation systems aren't functioning properly, you could run low on oxygen levels. Definitely. That's so funny. There's uh, another thing that we run into nowadays with newer homes. Uh, when we put newer materials in homes, uh, flooring, your, your paint, your drywall, uh, any kind of sealants, uh, any of the chemicals that we use to finish that home, uh, your, your staining on the windows, uh, there's something that happens with that. There's still the chemical inside of it and it outgasses. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, got to go somewhere. It does, and it sits in that product. That's that new home smell, mm. new car smell, new carpet. That's outgassing from the plastics and the chemicals inside of the car. Interesting. Um, I, I think they smell great, but they're not good <laughs> for you. So yeah, over time you're gonna need some fresh air. Yeah. So what the ERV systems do as well is they keep that from building up to a toxic level inside of your home, which. You know, a lot of them have unknown effects, so they can cause cancers, mm. uh, respiratory issues, and other stuff. So um, you really want the air in your home, because our homes are a shelter. Mm -hmm. You want the air in your home to be the 
cleanest, freshest air that you breathe. And you want it moving. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, stagnant air is not good for you either. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of what these ERV systems do. Mm. Yeah, nothing worse than coming home to chemicals, like to your point. Definitely. That's your... That's they say smell recipe. good. Right. <laughs> um, okay, I want to hit on one more thing. This is so valuable, and I'm sure I could talk to you all day, but I want to yeah. ask... I want to ask about rehabs. So we've touched on it. The homes in Longmont and even this whole, you know, front range area, they tend to be fairly old. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of development happened in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. They're great homes. They've got good bones, but a lot of people are renovating and they're not just putting in kitchens and master suites, but they're you know, we want to update some of these clunky old furnaces and big ducting systems and even some AC units. I know they just seem big and they seem expensive and they seem like, how am I going to get this out of my house if I want to, if I want to re overhaul the whole system? So I kind of wanted to ask you, like, first of all, do people completely overhaul the whole system? And is that insanely expensive? And do you have to do demo of all the construction, you know? And second of all, like, what are the newer, we talked about this cool new cutting edge efficiency model, but like, how often are you seeing projects like this and how hard is it to permit and are you better off scraping the house? Like, it just seems like one of the more daunting, scary renovations. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that is a very broad question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I like it. Uh, <laughs> So we have some of the neatest homes around here in Longmont, some of the older homes. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've seen so many just beautiful older homes that uh, we've done some really cool stuff to. Um, usually our older systems, the HVAC systems are gigantic. Uh, we, <laughs> we've pulled out these boilers that are as big as a room. Yeah. And uh, to replace that with some of the other equipment, we put this little tiny box in there, it takes care of the whole house. It's amazing. So it's a lot more, way more efficient. Uh, it heats and cools the house so much better. And um, it, really the return on investment on a system like that, it does pay for itself. Because mm -hmm. uh, if we look at some of the older systems between furnaces and boilers, they're running some of them were down to 30 or 40 percent efficient once we got up to the 70 80s we were pushing about 70 to 80 percent efficiency and we've kind of stuck to that in the 90s uh we started coming out with a little bit better equipment and by the by the early 2000s we've uh hit some really great efficiency markers with uh, mechanical equipment so they started getting smaller and they started working better yeah so i've had Throughout my career, uh, when I used to do installs and stuff, uh, I have a lot of customers very concerned because I'm pulling out this gigantic yeah. system and putting this little tiny box in there. And they're like, that's not going to eat my home. Trust me, it will. Yeah. <laughs> I was more talking about the ducting, though, like the big yeah. silver vents and the like, it's almost like this tunnel and it's got elbows and it seems yeah. to go through my whole basement. Like, do I have to rip that out? Do I want to rip that out? Can that stay? Like, I know what you're talking about. A, to get my giant furnace out and get a little box would be a dream. Yeah. But what's the impact of the rest of the stuff? Definitely. So um, it all depends on what you're trying to do with that home. Um, if you're trying to increase your ceiling heights, and um, I mean, I'm doing a home over in uh, uh, Longmont right now. Uh, it's got a private lake, beautiful piece of property. And uh, they wanted to put a whole HVAC system in there. And they couldn't figure out what to do with it. So they brought me in. I came and looked at the design. And by the time we got done putting this big duct work in, because they wanted cooling in the home, mm -hmm. and we would have had to have some pretty big duct work to do that, their ceiling height would have been almost out of code. Mm -hmm. So I came in and uh, worked out a mini split design uh, two outside units, and I think we did about 10 or 12 different indoor units. So basically each room would have its own unit. Um, and they were able to save all their ceiling height and uh, reduce the uh, cost of building uh, substantially. Mm. So the system pretty much paid for itself. Um, the benefit to that is Every room in that home, if you want to run, if, if you want this room at 60 degrees, 
it'll be 60 degrees. If you want this room at 80 degrees, it'll be 80 degrees. Mm. So each room has its own comfort level. Cool. Um, another thing that does is if you have some unused rooms in your home, like some guest bedrooms where nobody's actually in, you can turn it into an economy mode just mm. to make sure you know it doesn't get too cold in the winter and freeze something up. But you're not using any energy to heat or condition that space right. at that moment. So you're basically able to keep the temperature of the room that you want to at that comfort level. It's really nice. So we see multiple benefits and sides to energy efficiency um, and, and money savings along right. the road with systems like that. The so systems is, are expensive. Yeah. There's nothing cheap about anything anymore. But sticking with older equipment and uh, older uh, mechanical devices during a remodel of a home. Um, you're basically going with older technology. Um, they, will, they will heat and cool the house, but if to get those comfort levels and uh, utility savings and saving money in a system that will eventually pay for itself, um, I always recommend upgrading the equipment and getting stuff more modernized that is designed to make you more comfortable and save you money in your home. So it is possible to rip everything out, the ducting, the old big old furnace, that all can go away. I'm, I'm sure you've done it many times. Definitely. Um, yeah, so we've um, usually pull out pretty large, older, older equipments, really large. Um, when we put in newer equipment, it's a lot smaller, so it's always uh, questioned as we're putting it in because uh, I'm taking this gigantic furnace or boiler and we're putting just a little little box in its place. And uh, they've really uh, <clears throat> designed the equipment so much better that it doesn't have to be big and it can be efficient mm -hmm. and make your house even more comfortable than that, the big old giants can. So Right, so you get you get to be more comfortable in your space, you get to save money on your utilities, and it is possible. It's not so invasive to rip out old ducting, and then once you do it, you never have to kind of disrupt like that again. Yeah, and the biggest, bigger thing uh, getting away from uh, older duct work is uh, all the uh, pollens, dirts, and dusts that we have in our air, that all hangs out inside of your duct work. Uh, they do have duct cleaning services. Uh, but there's a reason why they have duct cleaning services is because ducks <laughs> get dirty. They absorb dust and air. They move it around your home. And if you ever noticed, you know, in your home, you just get done dusting your house. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden your furnace kicks on. Mm -hmm. There's a layer of dust everywhere. Mm. So um, going to newer systems like uh, mini splits, uh, hot water heat boilers, they don't throw dust around your house like the old... The old systems do, uh, you know, those big ducting systems, they they collect dust and they evenly distribute around your house. Many benefits to upgrading. So let's talk quickly about, um, you know, when to overhaul, if that happens. It sounds like age and just, you know, something breaking or something being ready to go, but also it sounds like just more, you know, separation of rooms, separation of duplexes. I know a lot of people have ADUs in their homes now. Have you seen a lot of I want two separate meters. I want two separate thermostats. I want two separate everything. Is that something that's possible? Is that something that's expensive? Does it involve ripping out everything that's there and giving mini splits to both units if it's a duplex scenario? Like, talk about complete overhaul. Definitely. So uh, we've uh, I've seen this uh, scenario for quite a few years. Uh, it started as a trend up in uh, up in Estes Park years ago. Um, we were taking old motels and turning them into individual units mm. um, for either overnight rentals or uh, permanent residence uh, for people. And basically what we would do is that whole entire motel would have a single system. It would have a gas meter, water meter, an electric meter, and it would have a common system that took care of the whole building. Um, so what we would do at that point is break up the system, put an individual water meter for each one of those units, and we would get an electric unit or an electric meter for each one of those units. Mm -hmm. And we could put a system in like a mini split. I see. And that would take care of the heating and air conditioning inside of that unit. And then at that point, it would be individualized from the other units. So per our previous conversation, you really just need electricity and water to be able to heat or cool that whole place. You don't need a giant furnace 
in a tiny little efficiency apartment to make it work. Correct. Um, so that's another uh, issue that we would run into with a, uh, a smaller individual unit like that is where you put the furnace. Um, Never mind the AC unit, the boiler, anything The water else heater need. and all yeah. that stuff. So you need a pretty decent sized room to put that equipment in. So that would take up from the footprint of say a studio apartment. Mm. So when we put in a mini split, it keeps everything nice and clean and you don't have to worry about taking up any more uh, floor uh, area of your home uh, to put a big mechanical room up. But that would involve, you know, if someone wants to make a single family home into a duplex, you do have to really lose what's there and then separately meter the two, three, four units, whatever you've got. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, if you broke it up, like uh, turn it into like uh, a single family into a multifamily or duplex. Yeah. Uh, definitely, uh, each one of those would have to have its own uh, water, gas, and electric meter. So, and that's the one thing that helps out uh, when you're doing a mechanical remodel like that. Mm -hmm. If you do go to a mini split or something, you don't have to worry about running the gas lines in the home because right. you can do electric hot water uh, with electric heating and cooling. And we're at that point, we're transferring heat instead of generating it, uh, like the older electric, electrical systems that cost people a lot of money. I love the way you so succinctly explained to me this concept of transfer. It, it, I mean, it still occurs for me as magic, but I just really appreciate that because I did not have the distinction of generating versus transferring. And it sounds like it's the wave of the future. I mean, thank God this technology is among us because we don't have room in this world for big, heavy mechanicals anymore. And I just so appreciate your time. I so appreciate your expertise. And um, thank you for teaching us way more than we've ever known about HVAC. I think you're wonderful. All right. Tell us again how, um, a little bit about Everest. How do we get in touch with you? How do we hire someone from Everest to come and help us out with this stuff? Definitely. So, uh, everestmechanical.com. <laughs> we'll take you to our website. And uh, real easy to navigate. It has all of our contact information and everything on there. Um, <clears throat> that'll, that'll get you to us. And from that point, we'll take care of you. And I understand you guys are plumbers. You're HVAC guys. You're cooling guys. You have refrigerating professionals. And... Therefore, my wait time is a little bit shorter. Is that, is that true or how does your scheduling work? So um, through the finesse of scheduling, uh, what we've done is we have a large work pool of guys that are multi-trained. So um, they, they really know what they're doing. They're really well trained. Mm -hmm. And one day, most, most of the time, you know a guy's gonna stick on construction or service. Um, when we get, light in either areas, we have enough of a working pool to transfer uh, technicians out uh, to make sure our customers are taken care of in their home. So we have a large work pool to work with um, and our scheduling usually happens that day if not the next day. Awesome. A big small business. Yeah. Everest <laughs> Mechanicals. Love you guys. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Thank you for here. having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. That's the property.